Thanks for being here. Subscribe to Cheating Stories Best, so you don't miss new stories. Is a double life normal? Today's story with a similar plot. Enjoy it! Phil sipped hazelnut coffee from a cured coffee maker as he scrolled through the list of emails sent to him since the bank he worked at closed the previous evening at 5 o'clock. There were 105 emails on the list, but he knew that about half of them were complete junk and had nothing to do with banking. How many emails can this gecko send every day? He thought thoughtfully. Maybe it was the coffee, or maybe it was the fact that it was Friday morning, but Phil was in a cheerful mood. He glanced at the clock on the wall. There were 6 hours and 53 minutes left until the end of the work wefek. Add to that a 90-minute commute, and before dark, he found himself in the arms of his loving wife of 26 years, Rowley, for the first time since he left for work on Monday morning. Rowley now spent most of her time at the family cottage near Lake Tipico in northeastern Indiana. She had spent the last two summers there, and the couple decided to extend it into this summer. Phil commuted from their home in the Fort Wayne area to and from work during the week and joined Rowley on the weekends. Leaving on Friday night and returning to Fort Wayne on Monday morning. Rowley and Phil had been officially empty nesters for two years now since their youngest son graduated from Michigan State University. With none of the children home anymore. Rowley spent about a month depressed and alone in their empty Fort Wayne home before offering to stay at the Lake Cottage full-time for the summer. If she's going to be alone most of the time, she might as well live in a cottage by the lake where she can swim and spend time on the beach, Phil thought. Of course, he missed her, but during the week, he could easily get by on his own, tending the lawn and doing other things. Phil and Rowley had owned the cottage for 10 years. When the boys were in school, the family spent many weekends in the three-bedroom house. Then Jeff got his degree and got a job two states away, and Robbie got his degree and a job on the West Coast. It was quiet in the house and quiet in the cottage. Phil was glad his wife could enjoy the lake while he worked. He was very happy when she retired a few years ago. And when she suggested they stay at the cottage by the lake and he would come over for the weekend, he was all for it. Isn't that what a lake house is for? So they can enjoy it as much as possible, he thought. I'm glad you're back full time. This will make life easier for everyone, Glenn Zam, Rowley said over lunch at the lake house Thursday afternoon. It's much easier for us when we don't have to organize meetings and go secretly. It's a slight inconvenience to keep everything kosher, Rowley smiled slightly. Well, finish the salad, and let's see how you like my kosher salami, Zam said with an evil grin on his face. Rowley raised her eyebrows and pretended to be shocked. Then she stood up from the kitchen stool, slowly walked over to Zam, unzipped his trousers, and reached inside. Hi baby, do you miss me? Phil asked Rowley on Friday as he left the bank for lunch. Yeah, yes baby. I wasn't expecting your call, she answered with slight hesitation. She stopped moving and gently placed her hand on the chest of the man she was riding. He quickly realized this and stopped moving under the curvy blonde. I figured you wouldn't call and just meet me here at 6.30 or so, Rowley continued. Phil detected a slight hesitation in Rowley's voice but didn't worry about it for a second. He was just glad to hear his wife's voice. I just wanted to say hi. God. I missed you. I forgot how hard the last two years have been, he said. Calm down, big boy, you'll be here in just a few hours, she said. I know. I just needed to hear you. See you soon, baby. Love you. I love you too, Rowley ended the call and threw the phone on the bed, smirking. She placed both hands on his chest, raised herself up, and then lowered herself, repeating the action over and over again. Sorry for the interruption, she smiled at the man. You know how possessive husbands can be sometimes. Yes, I know, he smiled back at her, reaching up to caress her large breasts. The couple gradually picked up speed and fell into a strong rhythm for about 15 minutes before the man make a sound. Oh, someone definitely missed me, she said. Ten minutes later, Rowley put several hundred bills in the pocket of her short robe, quickly kissed the man on the cheek, and closed the door behind him. The trap's cottage was the only one on the winding street. It was located a couple of blocks from the more expensive houses on the beach. It was easy to get in and out without attracting the attention of too many people. Rowley headed to the master bathroom to freshen up and get ready to meet her husband. 
She knew that after being gone for five days, she could probably leave a bad smell on her and Phil would never notice it. He walked through the door and within five minutes, she was lying on her back. Still, she knew it wasn't worth the risk of being stupid or careless. Rowley scheduled dinner for 7.30 p.m. after the couple had their reunion intim Rowley gave Phil every part of herself. She sincerely loved her husband and physically rejoiced at their union. On Saturday morning, the couple woke up hugging each other. They took a shower and went to dinner at a local restaurant. Several people waved to Rowley as she and Phil took their seats. Phil noted that she quickly became part of the community. Good for you, Phil laughed. I wonder how many of them think I'm your father. Although Phil and Rowley were the same age, Phil knew that his wife looked 10 years younger than him and could still turn a man's head. He saw several people turn their heads as they entered the small restaurant. Oh, come on, Re, said with a slight note in her voice. Not my father, although he is my older brother, Phil chuckled. Well, when you retire too, more people will recognize you, Rowley said. Among those in the restaurant who calmly observed the couple's communication was Glenn Zam. Arden Cunningham was a very good customer at Glenn Zam's car dealership. He was a handsome man of about 50 who kept himself in good physical shape. At 6 feet 4 inches and weighing 220 pounds, he reminded Rowley of a seasoned athlete. Rhee was lying naked on her back on the bed when Arden returned to the bedroom from the bathroom. That was amazing, big boy, Rowley admired. You are good yourself, Cunningham said. Your body gives me so much pleasure, Rowley's eyes lit up at the handsome man's compliments. She ran her hand over his chest as he lay back down. It was 4 p.m. when the couple woke up after an hour's sleep. Rowley reminded herself that Phil always called on Wednesday afternoons when he got home from work. Rowley enjoyed pleasing her men. It was almost a feeling of power, that was one of the reasons she loved it. She never thought of it as a job, profession, or vocation. Rowley knew she had come a long way in the past 27 months. Before she moved to a lake house for the summer two years ago, she would never have thought about having intimate with anyone other than her husband. Glenn Zam walked into the cafe with the confidence of a man who has the world by his fifth place. In his case, it was an accurate description. He was 55 years old, trim from hours at the gym, with attractive streaks of gray in his thick wavy black hair. He was handsome in a masculine way, like Russell Crowe. As the principal owner of 17 car dealerships in Illinois and Indiana, Zam always carried a fat wallet in his back pocket. The deputy noticed that on this Tuesday morning in May at 10.30, there weren't many people in the cafe. There were two couples of pensioners, two single pensioners, and a single pretty blonde who looked to be in her 30s or maybe closer to 40. The deputy noticed that the woman was wearing tight jeans and a tight blue long-sleeved sweater that showed off decent-sized breasts. She was reading from a tablet. The deputy smiled to himself. Years of experience as a car salesman came in handy when it came to communicating with people. The game had begun. He picked up his large cup of dark roast coffee and walked over to the blonde's table. I can guarantee that I am much more interesting than what you are reading, he told the woman. Rowley looked up from her tablet and smiled politely at the handsome man. She invited him to sit at her table. Sometimes I like the sass from a handsome man on a Tuesday morning, she said quietly. What a coincidence, I'd like to think I'm handsome, and I really specialize in sass, Zam said. By the way, my name is Glenn Zam. I live on Tippy Lake. Rowley couldn't help but smile at the man. She thought that he was not only handsome but also had pleasant manners. She introduced herself and told Zam that she also had a house on the lake. Zam noticed a wedding ring on the woman's finger. This didn't bother him at all. So, Mr. Trapp allows you to leave the house alone, he asked in a melodious, playful tone. Zam's smile widened when Rowley explained that she had moved to a lake house for the summer. He knew that his chances of having intim with this woman were greatly increased since her husband was away most of the time. Over a second cup of coffee, Zam told Rowley his story. He became a widower more than five years ago when his wife of 25 years died of cancer. She didn't seem to recognize him by name, so he decided to tell her about owning car dealerships. Exactly. I've seen you in those corny commercials, she said. Guilty on all counts, admitted the deputy. But this advertising brought me a lot of money. 
A few days later, they met again for a cup of coffee, and a few days later, Zam invited her to lunch. Two dinners followed. All Raleigh told Phil was that she had met several neighbors. The next dinner on Thursday night brought the couple to Zam's large lake house. After touring the 6,000 square feet home, they sat side by side on a luxurious couch and drank expensive dessert wine. Zam leaned over and kissed Raleigh tenderly on the lips. She blushed but didn't move away. The second time he kissed her with more force, and their tongues met in Ree's mouth. When they broke apart, Ree looked into Zam's eyes with a confused expression on her face. I've never done anything like this before, she practically whispered. I couldn't cheat on Phil, perhaps with any other man. The evening could have ended there, but Zam was an amazing salesman and just as good at seduction. He responded to Ree's hesitation, we don't have to do this, but you know we both want it, Zam said softly, holding Ree's left hand in his right. You're not taking anything away from your husband. He's not even here, so you're not sneaking around behind his back. You're an adult sensual woman, not his property. This is not love, it's just a night. We both like Intim. It's up to you. Rowley looked from their joined hands to Zan's handsome face. He leaned in for another kiss. Rowley wasn't the most experienced woman Zam had ever had, her experience was limited to her husband and three men before him. Nevertheless, Rowley was full of enthusiasm and gave herself completely to him. They clung to each other, talking and kissing. Ree was in high spirits, every nerve in her body seemed to come to life. She was surprised that she only felt a brief pang of guilt. An hour later, they had a second round. Rowley stayed overnight at Zam's house. When she woke up, he was lying behind her with his hand on her chest. She and Phil often woke up in the same position the next day. Phil arrived at the cottage a little after 6.30 p.m. By 6.45 p.m., she and Rowley were making passionate love. A few minutes later, Rowley turned her husband onto his back, which naturally confused him. On Monday morning, after Phil left the lake house for work, Rowley called Zam and asked if she was okay with everything that happened and if she had a good weekend with her husband. When she answered yes to both questions, Zam asked her if she would have dinner with him on Tuesday. She did not hesitate to give him a third affirmative answer. Dinner on Tuesday ended the same way as the previous dinner on Thursday. Both participants thoroughly enjoyed the evening. Beautiful evenings on Tuesdays and Thursdays quickly became commonplace. It was mid-July when Z asked Rowie if she could do him a favor. A very close friend of his was visiting for a few days, and he was hoping that Rowley would go on a date with him. I'm not asking you to sleep with him, doll. Andy is an old friend of mine, and I just want you to show him how to have a good time. He's not going through the best of times right now after divorcing his wife last year. I just ask you to be who you are, beautiful and charming, only for you, handsome, she replied. We'll just play it by ear. Rowley had heard all these horror stories about blind dates, but being a beautiful woman, she had never experienced anything like this. She was more than pleasantly surprised when Andy Siegfried showed up at the cottage to pick her up for a date. He appeared to be about 40 years old, had short blonde hair, and large brown eyes. He was approximately 6 feet 4 inches tall, and there was not an ounce of fat on his long, slender body. Great deal, Glenn, she thought to herself. The date went well. Relly thought. The couple returned to Relly's cottage a few hours later, two satisfied lovers, kissing at the door. Andy handed Relly a business card and some bills wrapped in a $100 bill. She tried to return the bills, but Andy insisted and refused to take them back. You're awesome. I'd like to see you again when I get back here, he said. Oh yes, Rowley replied enthusiastically. Was the money your idea? Rowie asked Sam as they gathered for dinner Thursday night. You know that I don't need money, right? I know. Andy is a good guy. You had a special date, he said. He was really funny. I wouldn't mind another date with him, Rowley smiled. Only if it doesn't interfere with us, said Zam. Oh, by the way, don't leave large sums of money anywhere, hubby will see this. A few weeks later, on a Wednesday morning, Rowley was leaving Zam's cottage when he asked her if she would agree to another date the following week. She hesitated for a few seconds before agreeing, on condition that he is as handsome as your last friend, she said. 
I will never offer you anything bad, Zam noted. Rowley took most of the cash she received from Zam's friend, Ronnie Gordon, and went to a small bank, where she opened an account. After Andy Siegfried gave her money after having intim with him, she opened an account only in her name and strictly online. Phil took a week off and spent it with Rowley at the lake house the first week of September. They spent the week grilling, drinking margaritas, and making love every night. Rowie wore several skimpy bikinis around the house for a week, and Phil thought he was really lucky that his 48-year-old wife still had the body of a 20-something. Rowley warned Zam that her husband would be at the lake house all week. The deputy tried to stay away, although he really missed what he considered his Tuesday and Thursday. To make up for Z's lack of intim this week, Rowley and Zam were together from Tuesday until noon on Friday the previous week. Rowley and Phil closed on the lake house on Monday and Tuesday of next week. Having spent the entire summer away from her usual home, Rowley was glad to return home and see her friends in the neighborhood. But she was not entirely happy about returning to her old, regular existence. She knew that she would meet Zam several times over the fall and winter. Phil was delighted to have Rowley back. In addition to having his wife and lover back in his bed, he got his best friend back. Little conversations, touches, glances, he missed all of this. Phil was hooked almost from the first time he saw Rowley on the University of Iowa campus. Both were students, but Rowley had just transferred from the University of Northern Iowa. She studied English, he studied finance. He needed to fulfill one of the requirements, so he enrolled in English Literature 212, a course on women in Shakespeare stories. Rowley took the class because she thought it would be fun and would give her an easy A. An ordinary American man, Phil immediately noticed Rowley when he looked around the class. She sat across the row from him, next to the football player. The couple seemed friendly, and Phil wondered if he had declared the blonde beauty his girlfriend. During the next class, Phil didn't notice the girl until she walked into the classroom right in front of the professor. She quickly looked around the room for empty seats and finally chose the seat next to Phil. Phil internally cursed at his bad luck because when she sat next to him, he couldn't look at her without being obvious. So, he turned his attention to the window to his left and spent most of the class watching the students walking back and forth across the campus. Phil was in his own little world when he felt a tap on his right shoulder. Class is over, genius, the blonde said. You know you could have gotten a higher grade if you had actually listened to Dr. Swartz instead of following the students walking past the building. Besides, why are you following girls walking past the building when I'm sitting right here? Am I chopped liver or something? Phil blushed, then stuttered trying to speak until his tongue finally caught up with his brain. At least it's gourmet pâté, he said. That's better, she said lightly. So. Why didn't you appreciate me? Because you're sitting too close for me to do it without being obvious, Phil replied. You know there are rules for such things. Next time, sit a few seats further back, preferably a row lower. Then I can watch you without being distracted. Or you can take me to the coffee shop on campus and watch me right now. It won't be difficult for me to drink coffee while you undress me with your eyes, she said, blushing. Hell yes, Phil was inspired. The couple dated for the next two years, becoming intimate on the third date. Phil believed they were in an exclusive relationship, unaware that Rowley had intimate with three other men while they were in college. Rowley knew she loved Phil with all her heart, but have a night with others was more an act than love. After all, Phil didn't own her, and she certainly loved Intim. The couple got married a year after graduating from university. Phil became an internal auditor at a bank. Rowley took a job teaching English in the same area. Because Phil was making good money, Rowley became a stay-at-home mom when her first child was born two years later. Glenn Zam waited a month after Rowley returned home to call. Experience told him that he needed to give the woman a few weeks alone in order to increase her receptivity. I'll be at the dealership in Fort Wayne for a few days next week. How about lunch on Tuesday or Wednesday? preferably Tuesday and Wednesday, asked the deputy. Both days, Re and Zam ate lunch and then retired to Zam's hotel room, which was located on the opposite side of Fort Wayne from Phil's bank. The couple scheduled a couple more days to meet in a month. How about we do something with Andy, asked the deputy. I keep my room reservation for the whole year. You guys could use it when I'm not here. 
Phil was not unaware that things changed somewhat in his relationship with Rowley. She seemed more sullen and distant in the bedroom. Intim with Rowley twice a week was still great, especially since Rowley seemed to be more receptive to more positions and an oral position. But the downside was that the couple seemed to have more intent and less lovemaking. Phil noted to himself. He once tried to ask Ree if there were problems between them, but she interrupted the conversation. Telling Phil that he didn't have to go into the bed if he didn't like something. End of discussion. Phil wasn't entirely convinced that Rowley would spend the entire summer next year at the Lake Cottage, but Rowley didn't discuss the subject. If you want to spend more time with me, then sometimes come to the cottage on weekdays, she said plaintively. Knowing that her husband would not want to make the 90-minute round trip from the cottage to his work more than once a week except under special circumstances. Rowley and Phil opened the lake house in mid-May, and by the end of the month, she and Glenn Zam had resumed their Tuesday and Thursday meeting schedule. A week later, Z arranged for Rowley to go out with another friend. As the summer progressed, Zam encouraged Rowley to have a night with several of his wealthy friends. Soon, she was training with friends twice a week, with Zam twice a week, and with her husband on weekends. Her bank account from dates with Zam's friends was growing at a good rate, and she got her own credit card to buy prettiest clothes and lingerie, which she hid in the back of the closet at the cottage. Given that her husband was only in the house on weekends and usually only had Intim with her when they were at the cottage, she knew it was unlikely that he would ever look in her closet. From time to time, Phil noticed small inconsistencies in Ree's actions and behavior, but because he trusted his wife completely, he never connected these actions and behavior together. In her heart and mind, she loved her husband, and what she did with other men was only physical pleasure, different from what she and Phil shared. Money never came first. Technically, Relly knew that receiving money for Intim was a crime, but she never asked for a reward. Apparently, Glenn had made some arrangements with the men he sent her. She certainly enjoyed this with his friends, all of whom seemed to be quite wealthy and good bed partners. Life was good for Rowley, even if the closing of the lake house at the end of the season made her dating life a little more awkward. Andy Siegfried was Rowley's first and still favorite client provided by Zam. He had asked her to go away with him for a long weekend sometime after the summer. But she would not have felt comfortable going away with another man and leaving Phil home alone until the opportunity presented itself by chance. Phil announced that he would attend a week-long banking seminar in San Francisco at the end of March, leave on Sunday, and return home the following Saturday. Rowley wasted no time in calling Andy back and telling him about the lucky break. Andy immediately booked the couple in Miami, Florida, for four days and five nights. Jorge Alvarez was an assistant branch manager for Crossroads Bank in Leesburg, Indiana. On the third day of a banking conference, sitting next to him at the lunch table was Phil Trapp, senior vice president of Flagstar Bank's Fort Wayne, Indiana branch. When Jorge saw the badge, he smiled to himself. What were the chances that he would remember the wife of the man sitting next to him at the conference in San Francisco? The six bank employees around the table discussed the topics of the day's seminar for a while and then moved on to more personal conversations. Halfway through dinner, Jorge told Phil about their affair a couple of years ago. I helped your wife open your account in my branch, Georgie told Philosophy I appreciate this business. How long have you had your lake house? Phil was completely confused. He handled all the banking and paid the bills himself. He knew nothing about the Crossroads bank account. He hoped his mouth wasn't hanging open stupidly. For about ten years now. For the past two years, Rowley has lived there all summer. I visit her on weekends. Do you see her often? Actually, I don't see her. It's basically an online account she told me. But once or twice a week, I see her at the entrance when she tops up her account. Phil's brain was now working overtime. He knew that technically, Jorge shouldn't have told him anything about the account since Phil wasn't on it. Rowley went shopping specifically for her trip to Miami with Andy. She spent about $6,000 on several outfits, new shoes, and of course, several pieces of exotic lingerie. That money was a drop in the bucket compared to what she had put into her secret account, and Phil never saw her separate credit card bill. Rowley loved feeling Andy's toned body as they played. He was also very creative and took the time to learn about Rowley's preferences. 
Intim with Andy was more egalitarian than with most of her other partners, where she did everything she could to please her partner without caring about herself. If Rowley was honest with herself, she knew she was probably too emotionally attached to Andy, even though it was just a night. With the others, including Glenn, she knew she was slowly falling in love with Andy. Spending all this time together, Rowley knew it wasn't good for her marriage. Rowley left about six hours after Phil left for the airport. For days passed quickly for Rowley. The couple dined in nice restaurants, went dancing, went shopping, and spent time on the beach, alternating this with, in Rowley's opinion, amazing intim. It felt like she and Andy were newlyweds. On Friday's flight home, Rowley was calm and thoughtful. For the first time, she thought about her actions. Until this week, it was always just a night. It wasn't necessarily better intimate, it was something new, different, and illegal. This week everything changed. Rowley folded her hands in her lap, and her right hand touched the large wad of bills in her pocket. Andy reached out and covered both of her hands with one large hand. He knew who she was, the wife of one man, the mistress of another, paid for intim by him and others. What if he had met her before her husband? Would he be her husband now? And if he were her husband now, would she cheat on him? When Phil walked through the door on Saturday night, both Phil and Rowley had a lot on their minds. Their greetings to each other were half-hearted at best, but both were so lost in their thoughts that they didn't even notice there was no reunion lovemaking, not even reunion intimate. Phil was glad to go back to work on Monday so he wouldn't have to be around his wife. He had to make several phone calls. Jorge Alvarez was surprised to hear from Phil Trapp on Monday afternoon, especially since Phil wasn't exactly Mr. Warmth at the San Francisco conference. At one of the dinners, they sat next to each other and seemed to get along, but suddenly Phil fell silent and did not say anything until the end of the dinner. For the rest of the conference, he practically avoided Jorge. Jorge, I think I owe you an apology, and I need professional courtesy, Phil said after the pleasantries. Phil explained to Jorge that he did not know about his wife's Crossroads account and was caught off guard because Rowley had no reason to transfer the money to a private account. Although it was illegal and unethical, he asked Jorge to send him the account information out of professional courtesy. Jorge complied with the request. Phil was shocked to see that Rowley had accumulated $58,000 in her private account, including a $66,000 deposit made at 9.15 that morning. Most of the deposits were made while Rowley was living at the lake house, but there were deposits made every few weeks throughout the rest of the year. As a veteran of the banking industry, Phil knew exactly who to call when he needed investigative work and video surveillance. Since early May, Rowley had moved back to living on the lake full-time. She found it a little strange that Phil agreed to it so easily this year after being reluctant to agree the previous two years. For a brief moment, she wondered if her husband was actually glad to see her out of the house. Could Phil be having an affair? Rowley's worries about Phil disappeared during her first Tuesday date with Glenn Zam at his lake house. It had been three weeks since the couple hooked up in Fort Wayne. It was a wonderful night, and the morning after, Rowley thought, as Glenn dropped her off at her own lake house. She'd have a few hours to lounge on the terrace before getting ready for her first date of the summer season. She always liked to have a night in her bed when she wasn't with Glenn and his. Phil knew his marriage was over five minutes after the investigator began his report. In the month since Rowley returned to the lake house, she had intimate with Glenn Z eight times at his house and also had intimate with six different men at the trap cottage. Seven times on each occasion at the trap home. Rowley's associates handed her a wad of cash. The investigator also gave Phil a flash drive containing video footage of Rowley's activities in their home. Phil could hardly hold back his tears. Everything turned out to be much worse than he could have imagined. His Rowley turned out to be not only a cheater but also did it for money. Phil looked at his watch for the twelfth time. Thirty minutes had passed since the light downstairs in the lake house went out and the light in his bedroom came on. From what he'd seen in the footage of his wife and her clients, by the time the 30 minutes were up, they'd be done with all the foreplay and moving on to the main part of their evening. Phil quietly entered the house and walked up the stairs. Because of the noise coming from the marital bedroom, he could probably walk into the house with a boombox slung over his shoulder and neither of the two occupants would hear him. Let him play until the end, we don't pay attention, Phil exclaimed, walking into the bedroom. 
What the hell? Arden began to shout, moving away from Rowley. No! Rowley screamed, trying to hide in the sheets. Phil walked up to his wife and handed her the ubiquitous manila envelope. Arden reached out and grabbed Phil's left arm, at which point Phil spun around and punched the naked man in the face with his right hand. Arden let out an ear-piercing scream as blood gushed from what had once been a chiseled nose. Phil reached down to the floor, grabbed Rowley's discarded white bikini panties, and wiped the blood off his hand. He walked over to the room's main closet, grabbed a few items of clothing, and left the room whistling a cheerful tune as he walked down the stairs. As he reached the bottom of the stairs, a thought struck him. You probably won't get paid for today's work, baby. Sorry, he shouted. Phil chuckled to himself and walked out the front door, leaving it wide open. Rowley had at least been smart enough not to try to contact Phil finally came on Friday, hoping that she could persuade him to join her at the cottage for the weekend as usual. Obviously, we need to talk, Rowley wrote to her husband. Do you think so? He answered. Rowley hoped that Phil would arrive on Friday evening as usual and stay over the weekend. She had to be content with the fact that he agreed to come on Saturday morning. Of course, Rowley was shocked when Phil showed up at the lake house on Wednesday night, given that he brought divorce papers with him. He knew about her extracurricular activities in advance. How did this happen? How much did he know? He knew enough, that was certain, but she hoped he didn't know the whole story. Rowley had donuts and coffee ready when Phil showed up at the house Saturday morning. For Phil, the donuts were the highlight of the meeting. The couple sat in silence until Phil finished eating. First, I'm so sorry, Phil, Rowley began, looking into her coffee cup. I'm especially sorry that you had to see it that evening. Phil was silent for several seconds. I've seen it before, just not as close and personal, he said quietly this time. Rowley was silent. She considered the implications of what her husband had just said. I know, philosophy. It may not seem like it, but I really love you and only you. I know it sounds corny, and it probably is, but it was just a night, she whispered. A hell of a lot of intimate with a hell of a lot of guys, and that's just this year, Phil said sharply. How long did this shit go on? The whole time you were here? What about when you were at home with me? Rowley began to realize that her husband was not quite the mushroom in the dark that she thought he was. She decided that her answers must be closer to the truth than she had planned. Yes, it started the first summer I stayed here. I missed you and made a mistake, but I liked it, and I decided that since you were not here, then I'm not taking anything away from you, seriously. Aren't you taking anything away from me because I wasn't with you? Since when does Fidelity have a nearby location clause? I must have missed that in the wedding vows. I could have had three years of fun with other women in Fort Wayne while you were here, Phil said. Rowley finally raised her head and stared at the table. Her lips moved, but no sound came out of her mouth. And one more thing, it's not enough that you were a traitor, but also having Intim for money. You didn't need the money, Rowley. It was all about Intim with new and different men, and doing it in secret made it that much more exciting, he said. I never asked for money, but when they handed it to me, the thought that I had just been paid for a night made me do everything possible for my partner. You know, Phil, I don't do anything by halves. Phil nodded slowly. So, is there anything I can say to get us together, Phil? Anything? I don't want to get a divorce. I love you more than your lovers am. Over the past few years, you've had almost as much intimate with him as you have with me. What about the character Siegfried? I've seen the way you look at him when you're with him, Rowley blushed deeply. Somehow Phil knew everything. There was little she could say in response. Maybe we should try going to a marriage counselor, philosophy. Anything? I don't want to get a divorce. Yeah, well, I don't want my wife to be a bad wife either, but I guess sometimes you can't always get what you want, Phil said. Rowley and her lawyer were able to convince the judge hearing the divorce case to order marriage counseling. This lasted one session. When the counselor found out what Rowley had been doing for three years, she stopped counseling. I didn't ask them to do this. This money was given to me as a gift, Rowley cried when the consultant called a spade a spade. Yes, they may not be able to arrest you, but a rose by any other name, said the consultant. 
Have you ever thought about personal counseling, Mrs. Trapp? Phil was looking for something unusual to read and was browsing the nonfiction shelves at one of the Allen County Public Library branches. He was lost in thought when he heard what sounded like someone jumping up and down a few feet away from him. Turning around, he saw that it was indeed someone jumping up and down, short, blonde, about five foot tall, trying to get a book from the top shelf. Her short skirt levitated and fell with each jump, giving Phil a view of the black panties she was wearing. The girl blushed when she realized that Phil was watching her. Oh, sorry, she said to Phil, smoothing out her skirt. Could you get me the Hemingway book on the second shelf? Phil also blushed when he realized that the girl had caught him looking at her panties. Of course, no problem, he said, handing her the book she asked for. The short blonde had sparkling blue eyes and round cheeks, Phil noted, handing her the book. She was probably the same age as one of his children, but there was something in those eyes that captivated Phil. Have you read a lot of his works? Phil asked the young girl. At the moment, I've only read three of his books, the girl answered with a smile that revealed two rows of perfect teeth. I'm not as convinced as others that he was a great writer, maybe for his time, but now some of the things he wrote do not stand up to criticism. I think he was half dud and half genius, Phil was stunned by the response. He felt the same way about Hemingway but did not expect to hear this opinion from the young lady. What are you, a Hemingway apologist or something? She asked. No, first of all, I'm shocked that the girl even reads a paper book. I thought you young people only read books on your iPad. But I'm also surprised because you're the first person I've met who agrees with my opinion of Hemingway, Phil said. The girl giggled. It wasn't a sound Phil had personally heard too often up close over the past year. I hope I'm not too annoying, miss, but could we continue this conversation over a good cup of coffee? Yes, that would be great. Let me look at this book first, she replied. The couple headed to the nearest Starbucks. Chantal Pearson was a 25-year-old marketing graduate from Indiana University. She worked as a copywriter for a small advertising agency in Fort Wayne. Phil told her about his life, including divorce. She found Phil as fascinating as he found her. When their meeting came to an end and how later, she asked for his mobile phone, he decided that she needed to call and handed her the phone. She quickly typed numbers and letters for a few seconds and then returned the phone. Like this. I wrote down my number and name. I would love to repeat this with you, she said happily. Yeah, me too, Phil answered shyly. Phil spent the next few days thinking about the girl. She was the first woman he contacted after divorcing his wife. Still, he felt awkward because she was half his age. Several more days passed before he decided to make a phone call. Hello, I was hoping you would call, Chantal exclaimed enthusiastically. I really enjoyed your company that evening. How about we expand our plans and have dinner this time? How would you like to visit an oyster bar? Oh, I would really like to. I haven't been there for a long time. It's not a place I can go within my budget, she said. The couple was halfway through a fabulous dinner when Chantal addressed the elephant in the room. You're pretty cool for an older guy, you know? You're the first guy in the last year who hasn't tried to undress me in the first half hour of a date. Either you're not interested in me or you're a gentleman. What exactly? Phil blushed and looked like a deer in headlights, which made Chantal giggly. I'm definitely interested in you, Phil said, but I'm also a gentleman. I've been like this all my life. My father would have beaten me to a pulp if some girl had said that I was messing around with her. But you're also a lifetime younger than me. How about we just enjoy this moment right now, she asked. You know, you might also be a lifetime smarter than me, Phil said. Rowley and Glenn Z were just finishing up their date when Glenn asked her if she wanted to go on another date. She always enjoyed the dates Glenn arranged for her, and she had to admit that things were much easier now that she didn't have to worry about her ex-husband. In addition, she now had free weekends, which she often used for dates. How would you feel about a younger guy this time, let's say someone around 30? Glenn asked. If only he gets your approval. You know I trust you, Rowley replied. Rowley's date was the son of one of Glenn's friends. He was a former college basketball player and was still in good physical shape. Although he was not distinguished by the sophistication of many of Rowley's other companions, 
he had youth and physical strength on his side. While enjoying intimate, Rowley admitted that physically, the young man was a little larger than she was used to. God, I need a nap, she said to herself as the young man handed her a wad of bills as he walked out the door. Phil was amazed that despite the age difference between him and Chantal, they were still dating six months later. On the third date, they entered into an intimate relationship. Although he was not physically the same person as he was 25 years ago, Phil made up for it with experience, enthusiasm, and love. Although she had only a few suitors with whom she could compare him, Chantal considered him an excellent lover. They hugged after an exciting session of lovemaking. Phil loved to cuddle after lovemaking and taught the young woman to appreciate this act. After a few minutes, Phil felt her body tense. He looked down and saw that she was looking at him with an unreadable expression on her face. Phil, you know I love you, right? Chantal whispered. Phil was sure he knew where this was going and, sighing heavily, rolled onto his back. No, no, Phil, all wrong, Chantal quickly stammered, realizing what Phil was thinking. I think we're great together, but I think you deserve better. The best. What are you? You hardly, honey, Phil chuckled. Well, what would you say about me plus 25 years? Phil drawled. There is only one woman in the whole world who could be better for you than me, and that is my mother. Could you do me one little favor and ask her out for once, please? Your mom, seriously? Chantal blinked her blue eyes and gave Phil her most charming smile as he whispered. Phil was shocked when he picked up Lala Pearson for their date two weeks later. Chantal told Phil that her mother was 25 years older, but if Phil didn't know better, he would have thought it was Chantal's older sister. The resemblance between them was uncanny except that Lala had light pink blonde hair. Lala was two years younger than Phil, 50, and had been married to Chantal's father for 18 years before divorcing him because he was a chronic cheater. As Chantal explained to Phil, she and her father had reconciled after several years of separation, however, her mother still doesn't talk to her ex. Phil and Lala enjoyed their date, although Lala noticed him looking at her awkwardly several times during the evening. Finally, she asked, you and your daughter are so similar that it's almost scary. Phil answered, it's like dating sisters. How much did you girls talk before this? State. Should I have performance anxiety? Lala giggled, sounding just like Chantal. Phil liked the sound but still thought it was weird. It's up to you. I didn't make any specific plans. Chantal trusts you completely, so I decided that I would just follow your example. None of us are kids anymore, right? I guess that takes some of the pressure off then, Phil said. But I have to warn you, I'm not as flexible as my daughter. Lala said, I understand perfectly. Phil grinned. At the end of the evening, the couple ended up at Phil's. It was the Wednesday before Thanksgiving. Rowley was planning a family dinner, the children were due to arrive on Thursday morning, and Phil plus one other person were to arrive in the afternoon to allow time for food. However, ahead of the big day, Rowley was enjoying her new favorite client, Jason Legg, 30, and one of his friends, Tommy Wickersham. Rowley met Jason immediately after her divorce from Phil, and he quickly became her favorite due to his age and energy. He asked Raleigh if she would be willing to have her first threesome and after some hesitation she agreed. They were in the midst of it when Raleigh's youngest son, Robbie, entered the lake house using the key he had. As he led the young woman into the house, he stopped in his tracks when he looked into the kitchen and saw his mother entertaining a couple of guests. Mother, he shouted in despair. We have to go, Robbie said to the young woman who followed him into the house. The girl stood frozen in place watching what was happening in the kitchen while Robbie tried to push her back out the door. Her introduction as Robbie's fiancé will have to wait until later. Oh God no Rowley screamed pulling away from her young lovers. Phil's phone rang before Robbie pulled the car out of the driveway at the lake house. Oh Dad D she was having a night with two young guys at the same time when CLA and I walked into the house. How can I face her again? Robbie blurted out, annoyed when Phil answered the phone. Wait, what? Answer philosophy slow down and talk to me, Robbie. Robbie explained to Phil that he had come home a day early to celebrate and introduce his parents to his fiancée. He wanted to surprise his mother and didn't call, but entered the house using his key. It was a surprise for him. 
You must remember, Robbie, that your mother is now a single woman and doesn't have to answer to anyone for what she does in the privacy of her own home. In the future, you should probably call before using your key, or maybe even give it away, Phil said. I can't believe you, of all people, are defending what she allows herself to do, Dad, Phil thought for a second and then chuckled. Teaching children is life's work, he thought to himself. If you were lucky enough to entertain two girls in a room, would you consider yourself immoral? Robbie asked philosophy I would consider myself dead because Claire would kill me, Robbie replied. And if you weren't engaged, what then, said philosophy. Just because your mother is over 50 doesn't mean she's not pretty. Well, I can tell you this, Dad. She'll get a plus one invitation to the wedding like everyone else, not a plus two, Robbie joked. I think that's fair, Phil said. Robbie and Claire spent the night at Phil's house. The next day, Thanksgiving, everyone went to the lake house to eat turkey and all the other dishes. Rye pulled her son and his fiancée aside and apologized as they pulled up to the lake house. When Phil entered the house, he looked at Rye and silently shook his head. She blushed appropriately. After a half dozen dates with Layla, Phil realized he had broken up with Chantal, but he didn't want their friendship to die, so he called her and set up a lunch date. Chantal, in turn, was delighted with the relationship Phil had with her mother. But how would you feel if we went further, Chantal? I don't want this to be awkward for any of us, Phil said. I'm fine, baby. Remember, it was I who gave you to your mother, she said, smiling widely. Okay, okay, you're right. But I would still like to keep you in my world as a friend, little minx. I really liked you. What about family, was inspired. I would make an excellent adopted daughter, you know. Mom thinks I'm a great daughter. You're as thin as a pie in the face, Phil said. It's only been six dates. Yes, but we also had a lot of dates. Can't you just transfer my account to her? Phil put his head in his hands and shook his head. He raised his head, smiling widely. You two would make a great team, half a pint squared, she giggled and smiled. Don't wait too long, Phil, and if it doesn't work out, don't hurt her. I could never hurt any of you, Phil said. I'm partial to fairies, you know. Six months later, Phil asked Layla to marry him. A month after that, she moved into his house. To Robbie and Claire's wedding, Rowley took her good friend Glenn Z, and Phil took his fiancée, Layla. The two couples met face to face for the first time when they sat next to each other in the row of the groom's parents minutes before the ceremony began. So, we finally met, philosophy. I'm Glenn Zam, Rowley's friend Zam said, approaching Phil with his hand outstretched. Phil looked at Zam blankly and did not extend his hand. As I understand it, friend and mediator, Phil said loud enough for only the four to hear. Whatever Zam said, removing his hand, Rowley glared at her ex-husband. She was too busy to notice that Claire's mother was also looking at her with the same fury. Claire told her parents about what she saw at the lake house a year ago. Robbie had introduced his mother to Claire's mother the night before at the rehearsal dinner. As Rowley began to step forward for the expected hug, the other woman squeezed her shoulder tightly, stopping the movement. She looked up in shock and blushed deeply, realizing that Claire's mother had heard about the date at the lake house. Claire's mother hugged Layla without hesitation, and it was obvious that the two women had already spent time in each other's presence. Rowley understood that she was an extra woman. Glenn Zam wasn't thrilled when the county health department told him his bed partner had contracted syphilis and he needed to get tested and get results back within a week. Rowley. I warned you about these young guys who always think they're invulnerable, he shouted to her on the phone. Rowley pulled the phone away from her ear as he screamed. She sat on the edge of the bed and sobbed. She learned about her intimate transmitted disease the day before at the doctor's office. The continued burning pain in her perineum told her she was in big trouble. The next day, Rowley learned she had an even more serious problem. In subsequent years, several more houses were built on the street where Rowley lived. One of them belonged to a famous doctor and his wife who found out exactly what Rowley was doing. Glenn Zam's lawyer was good and given that the arrest was Rowley's first, she was sentenced to only one year in prison with six months probation. Although she could have gotten up to six years on the felony charge, worse than the verdict. 
however, was the impact the crime and the ensuing publicity had on her family and life in general. Her children and parents were heartbroken. So, that day when I found you at your house having a night with those two guys, it was business. Oh God, Mom, Robbie said in a telephone conversation a few days after Rowley's arrest. How many guys have you done this with? Rowley didn't answer the last question, hoping it was just a bad reaction to the situation and not an actual question. While Rowley spent her days in orange, Layla chose cornflower blue for her wedding dress. Robbie was his father's best man, and Chantal was her mother's maid of honor. Rowley's conviction spurred Cusco County prosecutors to further investigate Glenn Zam's case, especially with the support of several of Zam's neighbors. At first, Zam laughed off the investigation, but as it spread to several cities in which he had dealerships in several areas of his various businesses, it became a serious concern. Negative publicity associated with Zam being investigated for his involvement in such a business led to the sharp decline of his dealerships. Zam lost millions when he sold his dealerships two years later. What do you think of our story today? It looks to me like Karma found a wife and that got Rowley arrested and she couldn't live with him properly. What do you think? Write in the comments. See you in the comments.